just wanted to start off with a little bit of background of why I'm here chatting, and thank you for having me along. Uh, and now I'll go into some of the sexy financial stuff. Um, so I grew up in the country um, at the back of a coal mine, and uh, my family were um, coal miners from Newcastle, and they made their way down to Gippsland a long time ago and um, settled on a farm there where I grew up. And uh, I remember going to a school excursion to the power station, as you did, and uh, I saw in this room a, a large 3D model that was laid out of the entire Latrobe Valley region. And it basically showed the whole area dug up for fossil fuel. Uh, and Loyang was planned to be maybe four or five times the size that it is currently. Um, and so that sort of uh, got me thinking about the environment and, and you know, not having a footy oval, not having a school, not having a house. And uh, sort of started me on my pathway to be an environmentalist. Um, then came up to Melbourne, went to uni, uh, had my first business at 19, which, which went well, surprisingly. And uh, I had 12 uh, fish and chipperies within a year and a half while I was at uni. So it's pretty full on. It wasn't an impact business, uh, but it um, was a financial business. So it sort of set me up as a young guy. Um, got married, had three kids pretty quickly. And uh, also ended up getting divorced in 2008, which was a real pivot point for me. Um, my brother died as well in that year, uh, very quickly from cancer. And um, I was sort of looking at my life thinking, you know, what's my purpose? Why am I here? You know, I've done well, but I'm still not really happy or fulfilled. And um, so I did a fellowship in sustainability, uh, which was with the Centre for Sustainability Leadership. And I also did, did the uh, Al Gore climate training in 2008. And so I thought, well, you know, I really want to get back into the environmental movement, love sustainability, uh, love property, and start to get into uh, Green Star and start building green buildings. So I ended up being a director at a, a very large uh, family construction company, and uh, we started to lead the way in sustainable projects. Um, then uh, I went into energy efficiency uh, and again started my own enterprise. Um, I grew that from zero to 70 million a year within three years, um, self-funded. And uh, around that time I bought a 300 acre forest at Darlesford, um, which is a region that I love. <laughs> uh, and also was one of the founding shareholders in the Hepburn Wind Farm um, way back then too, which was a great project to be involved in. So I love renewable energy and uh, interestingly, from a finance perspective, you know, the, the um, green energy and renewable funds are you know, outperforming all other investment categories at the moment, which is great to see. So it's, it's been great from investment as well, which sort of puts me to where I am, say, 12 months ago. Um, I launched an impact investment fund called Impact Investment Fund, and uh, we've got $100 million in that that we're starting to spend. Um, slowly, but uh, starting to spend, and we're, we're just about to launch a $50 million, uh, what's called an early stage venture capital limited partnership, which is really a fund designed for seed and startup um, businesses, and ours is impact based, so it's probably for how many people here have an idea that they want to turn into a business? Quite a few, and obviously you need cash, so come and see me. Um, <laughs> I think uh, since uh, back in December uh, last year, I launched a business called 110. And I'm not here to sales pitch it, but 110 is a social enterprise accelerator. And what that, the reason I started that is that I saw a massive gap between people that have an idea and that are going through some other sort of incubation or personal development programs like FYA, um, Social Traders Crunch, um, School for Social Entrepreneurs, Centre for Sustainability Leadership. They're all heavily focused on helping you sort of get your idea and, and craft that into a business plan or some sort of project to take forward. And where the gap was is, well, what do you do at the end of that? You know, because it's probably likely that you may or may not have the right structure. You may or may not have had a good mentor during that period. Um, and you probably don't have an MVP, but you have the idea of an MVP. And there's a massive gap there because no one will invest in you at that point, or very few. And it's hard to get philanthropic dollars, it's very competitive. Um, you sort of, they want you to be more advanced to the point where you almost don't need the money. And there's a bit of a saying is that, you know, when you don't need the money, 
you get advice, and when you do need the uh, sorry, when you need the money, you get advice, and when you don't need the money, when you ne need advice, uh, you get money. So um, yeah, I saw this massive gap. So I created a business that would um, help people in that position to access capital, to become investable, um, to learn all the things that the investors won't tell you. So I'm going to give you some insights into that. Um, the slides are pretty simple, so you might need to take down some notes. Um, there's also a Sprout podcast that I did around this topic and a bit more of my background. Um, so if you've got, I think it's half an hour, um, have a listen to that. And for everyone that's here today that's registered, we're also going to produce a, an e-book and send that out to you in the next sort of couple of weeks, which will um, have a lot of information in that. Um, you've all got postcards on your seat. And so something else we wanted to offer was um, one year free mentorship from me, whether you value that or not. Uh, but we've got a pitch it platform on the website. Um, so you can log in there and you can pitch your idea um, and we'll have a look through and assess those and then we'll, we'll pick one that we think that we can add great value to and help through a year long mentorship um, from myself. So it's pretty hands on, pretty intensive. You, me, locked in a room for a couple of hours, yeah, it'll send you crazy. Um, and so that brings us to um, what I'm currently doing now, which is heavily focused on 110. It's a, it's a social enterprise itself. Um, I work full time in that. I don't take a salary. Uh, it's purely uh, voluntary. And um, so far since January, I think I've had about 1,000 meetings. I've seen about 300 pitches come through. Uh, we've invested in six uh, social enterprise companies. We've donated around 40 grand cash. Uh, we've donated about another 50K in kind, in good services. Um, our team's donated about 15 uh, days um, pro bono to causes that they care about. They're totally open to do donate their time to whoever they want. Um, they get paid for it. Uh, and we've got some amazing partnerships and uh, working with uh, about 50 clients across not-for-profit, social enterprise and corporate. Uh, just last week, we dished out 300K on behalf of Optus to the Future Makers, which was a program around tech for good and uh, we had 200 applications. We got down to 11 finalists. They all pitched for three minutes to myself, Daniel Flynn from Thank You, Jan Owen from FYA and the chairman of Optus. And uh, the six winners walked away at 50 grand each. So it was pretty uh, exciting three minutes for them. Uh, and the ones that missed out on the cash that still had some good ideas are getting some ongoing mentoring and support as well. Um, so that's a little bit of background about where I'm at so far. Um, so I just want to ask some questions and, and just get a feel for where you're at in the room and what challenges you've had. So please do raise your hand if any of these apply to you because that helps me craft the session to suit you. Um, so has anyone ever asked four bucks for a coffee? Probably from a work colleague or someone else because you've left your wallet in the office, at home. I try to leave it uh, in the office when we go out for lunch. <laughs> Anyone ever ask their family for 10 grand? Could be like emergency or house deposit or any of those big spends. Anyone ever ask for 100 grand for a new venture? Couple, excellent. And anyone ask for a million dollars from an investor? Okay, cool. Um, it's interesting because you know most people have done the first couple and then not many have, have asked. Raising money is really hard. It's incredibly hard. Whether you're experienced in it or not experienced in it, it's incredibly difficult to get an investor to sign on the dotted line, agree to back your company, and generally they're backing you as a person. The, the company's a vehicle, but they've got to have a high level of trust in you. Um, and I'll run through some of my tips coming up. But uh, yeah, it, it's really hard to get a million bucks, particularly in Australia. Um, quite difficult. They, they need to be pretty sure that there's very low risk um, and that the upside is from a million, the upside's got to be at 10 million. Yeah, and that's a, that's a big ask. So um, yeah, if uh, you're not sure about easy or hard, hard. Uh, 100 grand, not so hard. Uh, can be hard from a bank, 
uh, but it can be a bit easier from investors. Um, but again, there's a few things that you need to have in order and some questions that you need to be able to answer that investors are going to ask in order to unlock uh, that cash. Generally, you'll find that the investor that is putting in the 100 grand in early stage is probably the investor that's going to be giving you a million bucks in 12 months time or 18 months time. What makes a company investable? So a mate of mine is Ressi. Uh, he's based in the US in Silicon Valley. 1,600 companies, startups, space, founder institute, 150 chapters across the world and growing. And so he helps tech-based organizations. Uh, I'm well far from commercializing 1,600 companies, but uh, I own 15 at the moment and I've commercialized 35, so I'm starting off. Um, but uh, he, like many other investors, uses the tick and cross methodology. So when they're talking to you and they might invite you to their office or you've been chasing and chasing, and I saw one guy last night at the function I was at at General Assembly, he goes, I've been trying to have a phone call with you for a month. I said, yeah, sorry, there's just a process and there's people in front of you. So, you know, it takes that sort of time sometimes to get a phone call or a meeting and get in front of investors. And so when I'm hearing people pitch verbally, you can come and pitch to me later, but anyone that's pitching to me, in my mind, I'm going through a tick or a cross in this area. So team, it's all about the people for me to start with and impact. So when you're pitching to me, I'm looking for who are you, what have you done, are you a risk, do I think you can execute on the delivery of, of this business idea that you've got to change the world. Um, who else is around you? You know, what other team members have you got? Solo founders, uh, it's pretty hard to invest in, in them. You've got to have a team around them unless they're an outstanding individual. Um, and having said that, we just invested in a solo founder um, about two months ago um, because he is an outstanding individual. Um, so who's the team around you? Do you have an advisory board? Have you got some big names on there? You know, like I've started an energy company and Elon Musk is my chairman of the board. Okay, bang, big tick. You know, he's demonstrated experience. He's an amazing guy. Um, you know, if you've been able to attract someone of quality to a board, that means that they believe in you, they believe in the idea, and that's a lot about credibility in being able to put a tick in that box. Um, if you say, hey, it's just me, I've never had a business before, uh, I've got an idea and, um, yeah, I want to change the world, but, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, okay, that's a bit of a worry. Um, traction. So what sort of traction have you had so far? So do you have sales? Have you got any revenue coming through? Um, you know, do you have partnerships? Do you have potential clients that have signed MOUs or agreements? Um, you know, having some good traction is really important for us because we want to see that you can get to the execution pathway pretty quickly. Uh, and the quicker you can get sales, the less reliant you are on my capital to cover overhead or cash burn. And so cash burn is the amount of money you're spending in addition to what's coming in and, and your overhead that you have to pay for. Um, the model, so in essence, what is that financial model? What is the business model around what you're doing? You know, if it's a software platform, is it a SaaS model? Like um, one of the platforms out there for board governance is, you know, $995 establishment fee. What's that for? That's just a profit grab. Uh, and 79 bucks a month uh, for three users um, and an additional $15 a month per user, right? So in my head, I'm trying to calculate, right, how many times does he need to be able to sell that to start making some serious money, right? He needs a lot of users using um, that. It's aimed at boards, which is interesting because normally a board will have seven to nine people in it. So then is every one of those people a user because they need access to the board documents in a meeting. So can that business get some volume? Probably. Um, it's having moderate impact. It's positive impact on the board members, but not more widely than really. Um, so, yeah, we're looking heavily at the model. What sort of model is it? Is it scalable? Is there growth in there? Um, the market, and the market can be broken down in a few different sectors. So it's about, you know, a target or addressable market and also an achievable market. So you might say, hey, my idea is going to help everyone that's on Facebook. You go, yeah, right. 
okay, so everyone on Facebook is your customer? Unlikely. Let's just drill that back down to what's achievable in getting your product in the hands of users. Um, there's been a few apps in Australia that have achieved a million users, and that's, that's a pretty high benchmark to get a million users. It's not easy if you think you're going to do an app, put it on the App Store and generate a million users. Yeah, it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of time to get there. Uh, and with an app, you need a million users to monetize that because you're not going to be making any money in anything less than that. You'd really be struggling. Last one that we're looking for, uh, I suppose that's where uh, impact investors and social entrepreneurs like myself vary to your traditional tech investor, is that you know, we're really serious about what impact are you making. And it's got to be deep impact as well. It can't just be that, hey, I'm helping that person. It's got to be that you're helping a community, you're helping solve a societal problem, you're helping the environment. It has to be broad and deep. Um, I've had this uh, person come and, and present to me and say, hey, I've got this idea. It's about providing you know, experiences and luxury experiences, and um, we're going to provide that to a charity for free. And I'm like, mm, not really impact. You know, it's, it's not deep. It's um, not changing people's lives. It's, it's like if McDonald's wrote a million dollar check um, is that good CSR and impact? Absolutely not, um, because it's not. They're still making burgers to uh, feed to kids and um, adults alike. Uh, writing um, a million dollar check doesn't um, abate what they're doing in that sphere. Um, so yeah, we're pretty hardcore about impact. Just to drill down a little bit on the on the team, uh, and I'll probably just use 110 as a good example because um, it's it's close to me and. Uh, what better example than what I'm doing myself? It's uh, you know not to be up here preaching and saying, oh, well, I haven't actually done it. But um, you know, pulled together a really good team. We just appointed uh, an under 30 CEO, um, Veronica Munro. Um, interestingly, I've been mentoring her for for 12 months prior, uh, and then I gave her 10% of the company um, six months ago, and uh, she just fulfilled a senior role in the business, um, but the whole time I was grooming her into the CEO role. And when I presented to her and said, hey, I'd love for you to be CEO, she's like, oh no, I'm not ready, I can't do it. Um, you know, I'm not experienced, I've never ha had that role before. And I said, but the way that you learn is you get the opportunity, grab it, go in there, work through it. I'm a bit of a standing board or a backup. Um, and, you know, she's been amazing. Uh, she's really taken it on. She's very capable, intelligent, high performer. Everyone in the 110 teams are high performer. So at least an 8 out of 10 in, in our mind. Um, and, uh, yeah, it helps build and grow the team. And then that attracts other people to the organisation. Um, uh, it's probably no accident that about 7 out of 10 staff in the business are female. Um, couple of blokes thrown in there, but, um, and, you know, we, in our uh, approach to building a team is that we de-identify all CVs. So we have no names, we have no genders on the CV, and we ask people applying to remove all references. So not she and he, it's all I and speaking the third person. So we don't know who that person is other than the experience that they've had. And so that's a great way for us to make sure that we're getting gender diversity into the organisation and that the best person for that uh, position is, is selected. Um, so building a strong team is also about the different skill sets that they bring and um, investors are looking for a team that has strengths. If, if you've got a platform then obviously you need some technical skills in-house, um, you need some leadership in there, forward thinking strategy, different personalities, we're looking at the team as a whole. You can't just have all um, A-type alpha dogs uh, running the company. That won't work well. Um, and also looking at the forward plan. So, you know, understanding what your org structure looks like now is going to be very different when you snag a million bucks and you're starting to scale your impact and scale your organisation. So who are the other first hires that you need? You might not know them by name, but you could certainly write a position description around them and put a bit of detail there about, you know, what characteristics do they have, what skill sets do they have, even pinpoint like our latest hire in Sydney, um, we wanted to poach someone from one of the big four professional consultancies and we ended up getting a general manager from KPMG, which sounds odd for a social enterprise um, 
you know, helping off for profits, but we wanted the skill set that that person had and we knew where they would come from. Um, and it just happens that it was a young uh, lady. So yeah, investors are looking for a solid team. In addition to your, your first employees and your current team, we're also looking at advisory board. Um, so in that, we're looking for some experienced leaders that are familiar with the sector or familiar with the business that you're developing. Um, that they're on board in a formal sense. So that doesn't mean, yeah, I know a person knows a person and we've whacked them up on the website. It's got to be um, someone that you've got the formal engagement with to say, hey, listen, we'd like you to be on the advisory. We'd like you to come to meetings every you know, month or every quarter. Uh, and we'd like to be able to get some input from you for free uh, when we need it or ask for it or bounce things off you. So you know, that's what a, an advisory board looks like. You should have around you know, five to seven skilled people on there that again bring different skill sets. A lot of the time some early investors will come from the advisory board group if you've selected them well and have that in your mind that you know, hey, if, that, if I'm gonna put that person on an advisory, could they invest, they have some cash or they have some leverage. Um, you also wanna look at how they could help you with sales, um, how they could help you with a connected network as well. In some cases, being able to get in front of the right person is sometimes more valuable than the 50 grand. It could lead to sales. And an uh, example of that is a company we're working with at the moment called Fruit to Work. It, um, it helps former offenders get back to work. Uh, I said, you know, how much do you need? And they said, well, if you can find us a client that'll buy, you know, 300 boxes of fruit a week, um, national client, obviously, uh, then that'd be fantastic because that means we can get another couple of staff working in the business. Sure, no problems. Here's a few names, here's a few things. And then Core Chambers West Garth are buying 100 boxes a week uh, of fruit at the moment. So, you know, that's revenue for that company, which, which they really value. Feel free to jump in and ask questions so it's just not me speaking up the front at any time. Yep. What's the single biggest challenge that a, um, a founder faces when they come pitching for business? Sure. Uh, a single it's biggest... A, it's a very open... No, no, that's right. Uh, it's a pretty easy answer um, because they pitch too early. They're not investable and they're not ready at the point that they go to an investor. Um, and what will happen is, you know, investors are not looking for a reason to say no. Like, you know, we want to say yes, we want to invest. I've got plenty of money I want to invest. You need to show me that you're ready for that investment. And, and the biggest barrier that founders have is that they think that they're ready they go and see an investor and an investor says, no, no, no. Or you say, oh, we don't have any competitors. I go, wow, 30 seconds on Google, I reckon I could bring up six competitors. Um, you know, so yeah, they're just not ready for the investment and that means the investor will say no, it's embarrassing for the founder. Um, the investor feels a bit uncomfortable because you, know, you, you haven't been prepared, we don't like to say no. Uh, and then he'll say, come back and see me in six months. Right, so then you've got to go away, do all that work, and, and come back again. Um, knowing your business and customers inside out. Uh, so customers are super important, and the 110 example again is that, um, you know, since January, six months, we've worked with 50 clients, um, not-for-profit sector, entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, accelerator participants. Um, you know, that's not aggressive enough as far as I'm concerned, but you know, I have to remind myself that we're just starting out. Um, but uh, you've got to know what your business is great at, what niche you're working in, what you provide that no one else is providing, so your value proposition, um, and also what your customers want. And you know, we spent, um, well, I first had the idea for 110 in 2008, and I didn't launch it till 2015. So it took me a while, and it took the market a while to catch up, because in 2008 when I said, I want to create an incubator for social enterprise. No one knew what I was talking about, uh, particularly investors, they had no idea. Uh, well, okay, maybe I'll just cool my heels a little bit and wait for everyone to catch up and then I'll, I'll launch once I've done some more work. So spent six months really grinding out the business uh, between July and December last year. Research, uh, data analytics, speaking to as many people as I could to find out what customers would actually want. And um, yeah, once I found that out, I sort of mapped the entire social enterprise ecosystem in Australia, which took me a lot longer than what I thought it would, but it was a really valuable exercise. And I saw this gate 
in hole. I went, right, okay, bang. I'll just form my business around addressing all the issues with that gaping hole. Uh, and then went and tested it with customers and said, you know, if I could provide this service to you, would you like it? What about this one? What about that one? And that got us to the point where we launched in December last year. Um, know the value that you offer. Again, in your business, investors are looking for what's a value in what you're offering to customers. Is it financial value? Is it impact? Is it helping people with a mental health issue? You know, what, what is that value proposition? Um, and it's got to be really strong. They've got to believe in that people will want to pay for whatever it is you're wanting to sell. Um, it has to be super strong. Building relationships, again, you know, like with anything, relationships are so important. Um, investor relationships can be quite challenging. On average, you need to have 20 hours of touch points per investor for them to invest in you. You know, if you think of that's 20 coffees, you have to try and complete that within six to eight weeks because, you know, they'll get interested, they'll get hot, they'll like the idea, you're starting to build up this banter and relationship. They'll be asking you for all sorts of information to help with due diligence. You need to be able to provide that to them in a quick and efficient manner, which means you have to have that ready and know the questions that they're gonna ask before you go to see them. Um, because if you're ill-prepared, like we sort of spoke about before, the big barrier to not getting investment is not being ready to take that investment on. Um, you need to know your business better than an investor. And that means do your research, do your homework, jump on Google, you know, who else is doing a charity giving platform, Brrrp, out pops the list, uh, you know, why are you better or different to all of those other players? And don't just look locally, you have to look globally. Um, businesses that we invest in have to be high growth, high impact uh, in order to do that. And, and a great way to deliver massive impact is um, being able to scale globally. Uh, we work with clients in India, uh, Vanuatu, Kenya, Joburg, Singapore, um, UK. Um, our one in India uh, just won a 10 year contract with the Indian government to deliver um, training for unskilled workers to lift up their skills so that, that can help their economic um, outlook as well. Show your passion. Um, so I'm a pretty passionate person, pretty hard to hide that. Investors love to see passion. If you're not up and about and passionate about your own business, that's gonna be pretty hard to convince them to be passionate about it as well. Um, and showing your passion right from the start, particularly when it's, it's tough at the start, getting other people engaged, your advisory board will join you because you're demonstrating passion about whatever impact you want to make. Um, they'll love that. They'll love to get on board and back you if you can demonstrate that passion and do it in a really authentic, natural, you know, what you see is what you get type of way. Um, investors will pick through pretty quickly if you're just there asking for cash because you need to pay yourself 100K a year wage. When you present financials to investors, yeah, try to refrain from paying yourself an exorbitant um, wage. They don't like to see that. They, they want to see you, unless you've already you know, contributed a year or two years of unpaid blood, sweat and tears into getting that idea to a point, um, they won't want to see you raise half a million bucks and then take 100k a year salary. Yeah, sure. Look, salaries are okay. Um, when you're structuring up a social enterprise from scratch, probably with a group of people, and you're looking to take on investment, the first thing I'd suggest is preparing what's called a vesting schedule. And so the founding team, based on their time and skill that they're contributing, should be allocated some shareholding within that entity. Um, just because there's four of you doesn't mean it's 25% each. If Joe Bloggs is working three, four days a week and the other guy or girl is working one day a week part-time, um, then it's got to be equitable amongst that group. Split your shares up like that. Um, at the end of 12 months, if you fulfill that commitment, then those shares transfer to you. For that time being, they're held in the company. Um, that stops any arguments that the founding group may have. Um, when you're looking at bringing in investment, if you do need to take on salaries to support yourself or you're transitioning, maybe it's one person within that group that, that says, hey, I'm gonna step away from my corporate job and I'm gonna work in this full time and I need to get a salary from that. So it's, it's totally fine to do that. But if you're raising half a million bucks and you've got four founders in there all wanting to pull out a 100K salary, 
where's the rest of the money for building the business, um, you know, and, and investing in the business itself. So um, it, it's got to be balanced, you know. And yeah, I know it's hard. It's, if, if it was easy, everyone would be a successful entrepreneur with multiple businesses, but it is quite hard and you've got to commit that time. But when you go to an investor and you say, hey, you know what, I've been working 12 months in this thing with not drawing any money out, they give you some respect for that and, and some acknowledgement to say, right, okay, that's commitment, that's good. This demonstrates the character of the person. It's more likely that they'll invest in someone like that um, than someone that's just stepping up for, uh, for cash. <laughs>